Hello, everybody. I'm grateful to the Creative Documentary Course, Sri Aurobindo Center, and Thinking Film for inviting me to give this talk today. My talk, as you know, is titled Film Thieves, Influence, Memory, and History in Film. I'll be looking at some moments and some references that have been important to me and in many ways have shaped my approach to my practice as a cinematographer and a filmmaker. Of course, my influences are many, but I've chosen a key few that seemed relevant to this talk. Now, we all grow up with our very specific influences. Some of these are personal and some belong to a larger collective consciousness, which includes our memory and history. In the next 40 minutes or so, and I'll try not to overcarry too much, I'll take you through some thoughts on the associations we make while writing, filming, editing, and viewing films. I'd like to mention at the very outset that the title of this talk, Film Thieves, itself is stolen. It's stolen from a chapter of the same title in the Wim Wenders book, The Logic of Images. And in this text, he answers questions on his inspirations and about stealing from films of all kinds, including what he calls, within quotes, mediocre films. I'll read sections from this chapter and build on it with my own references. Some of these are very film school references, and there are others that ought to be. Now, the context for this talk by Wim Wenders was a public screening of Yasujiro Ozu's Tokyo story, or Tokyo Manu Monogatari, as it's called in Japanese, in Rome in 1982. Wenders had been asked by the organizers to screen excerpts from films that had been major influences for him and his work and talk about them. And he chose to screen the entire film Tokyo Story. We know that Wenders was greatly influenced by Ozu as a filmmaker. And I read from his talk here. I can't claim to have stolen anything from Tokyo Story. I've stolen plenty of things from American films, for example, but nothing from this one. It's easiest to steal from thieves, and Ozu is no thief. You can learn from him, but not pilfer things from him. The most important thing I, thing I learned from him, from this film, and from all others of his that I have seen is this, that life itself is the greatest possible adventure for cinema. I also learned that it makes no sense to try to force a story on a film. I've learned from Ozu that you can have a narrative film without a storyline. You have to believe in the characters and allow them to arrive at a story about themselves. You shouldn't start with the story in mind and then look for appropriate characters. You must begin with the characters instead and in collaboration with them, look for their story. Now, this is extremely film school. And he's talking about his personal reading of Ozu. What he's saying is equally applicable to both fiction and nonfiction films. And I must confess that I too am drawn to this way of letting my characters in documentary films perform a script that I can then work with. So my characters write my script for me. And of course, it's not that easy because they have to be guided into doing that while you're making your film. I'll read on from the vendor's text. There's a question. Do you go to the cinema much? And he says, in bursts. While I'm shooting, I don't look at other films. And the rest of the time, I'll sometimes go every day. Often, I'll just go and see whatever is playing, regardless. Usually, mediocre films. There's a lot that you can steal there. Now, I'm not getting into what Wenders calls mediocre films here. But I'm truly interested in this act of stealing from others' work itself. It's not only ideas, characters, or formal elements like color and montage but also our memory of film, which contains a collective history. One of my earliest memories of film viewing as a child is the playing of the national anthem at the end of the film in cinemas. It was a black and white image and the fluttering national flag you know, at the end of the film. My mother tells me that my constant refrain during the film used to be Janda Kabayga, meaning when will they show the flag and when the hell do we get out of here? 
if I were to find a, such a kid now, I would probably be very unhappy. Um, yeah, because they're disturbing my film. Now, this memory of watching film collectively shapes us and binds us in a shared history. Films that we watch with family, films that we watch with friends, films that we watch while at film school, where you watch them with utmost decorum and sincerity, and you very often sleep in them. And of late, increasingly privately on our own personal devices. Now, coming to my work, I often treat existing films as my material, as my text. It becomes a way to engage with collective history and memory through archival practice and found footage practice. But I'll get into all that a little later in the talk. Filmmakers have been self-reflexive and self-critical about their practice since the very early days of cinema. Two examples of this are Ziga Vertov's Man with the Movie Camera, 1929, and a delightful film shooting sequence in Vishantaram's Manus or Admi, made in 1939 for Prabhat Studio. Now I'm going to start by showing you a playful clip from my first film, Snapshots from a Family Album, from 2004. Um, this is a film that Phil pits film history against personal history. And I'll get into that a little later. Uh, what I'm going to show you is the last scene from the film, where my mother and I are talking pretty much in film reference, as we do throughout the film. And in this scene, you know, just at the end of the film, we'll, we are both falling asleep. And there's a banter where we are still talking in film reference. Let's, let's watch it. एनर्जी <laughs> तो मैं आठ फिल्म अच्छी नहीं देखती क्या? नहीं लगती हैं। फिर लोगों को नहीं पसंद आती ना? तुम तुम्हें आती है क्यों? हाँ मुझे तो आती है। तो तुम्हें क्या प्रॉब्लम है मेरी आठ फिल्म बनने में? मेरी आठ फिल्म की नायिका बनने में तुम्हें क्या है तरह से? आठ फिल्म बनाने से किसी को फायदा नहीं होता ना दर्शकों को ना निर्माता को अच्छा क्योंकि फिल्म मनोरंजन का माध्यम है सो गई मैं बोल रही ओके सो या वी टॉक इन फिल्म एंड वी ऑफन टॉक अबाउट वाई वी मेक फिल्म एंड आई थिंक लिटिल हेज चेंज इन so many years but um, you can see that this habit of communicating in reference and quotation runs in the family it happens in everyday conversations at home and finds its way into my films snapshots was made over a five year period it looks at my parents living out of two different cities delhi and bombay as they both approached retirement this was a period where our family was trying to conform as me and my brother were finding our feet in our respective careers in film and advertising 
Through looking at the history of the family, the film places us as citizens of a nation in transition at the turn of the 20th century. The serious setting of what would otherwise be an autoethnographic film is oiled by humor, intimacy, music reference, and a great love for cinema, me having recently come out of film school. The film is constructed like a home video and edited to look loose, to give it the illusion of the everyday, the real. Now for me, a primary reference while making snapshots was Reena Mohan's well-known film, Kamla Bai, from the early 90s. This is a film about Kamla Bai Gokhale, the first woman on Indian screen. And it uses a specific language of intimacy and trust and a sense of time in the way it's constructed. Um, and all of this goes on to work out a relationship between the character and the filmmaker, which again is built over a period of time. And the character here again happens to be an elderly woman who lives alone. Through this intimacy, I mean, this language of intimacy, the film opens out a large canvas of cultural history of gender and on performance. Uh, this excerpt from Kamla Bai, you know, and you can see with its quiet, available night photography of Ranjan Palit and K.U. Mohanan. Unfortunately, the audio is a little unclear at this point in the film, but it's subtitled, so you'll get a sense of it. In any case, I only want to show it for the sense of time and the sense of atmosphere it has. जिसके बाद में चला था बात तो ये Shantam <laughs> Okay. Um, for some reason, I seem to be showing you a lot of closing sequences. There are more coming up later. Um, having trained as a cinematographer, I have especially been interested in the work of other cinematographers who went on to become filmmakers. There's a specific way in which your discipline informs your filmmaking. There's a specific way in which a cinematographer might look at a scene, as there's a specific way in which a writer or an editor will make a film. It's evident in the work of Bimal Roy, who started as a cinematographer, and Rishikesh Mukherjee, who started as an editor. Coincidence, I started as a cameraman, as still am. Reena Mohan, an editor, and still is. I'm interested in the way filmmakers look at people as space in their mise en scene, be it Bimal Roy and Bandini, Balu Mahindra and Sadhwa, and in the many different ways in the films of people like SNS Shastri, Ravi Kant Nagaich, and Narivan Irani, all cinematographers. You'll see that the names that I mentioned here range from what would be called serious cinema within quotes to what vendors might refer to as mediocre within quotes again. And I would disagree with him as there's great conviction in all the works, you know, of all these people that I mentioned here. And we'll see some of it. Now, the third clip is a song, and I'm going to show you an excerpt. It's a song from my childhood, and I think it's a song from the childhood of many people who are watching this right now. I mean, at least the Gen Xers and thereabouts. But it's a song that you're familiar with. It's Ek Pyar Ka Nagma Hai from Manoj Kumar's film Shukur from 1972. 
again, you can see that I'm going from mother to Kamla Bai to the mother in this film, played by Nanda. The song is not only haunting in its music, but it's filmed in this haunting manner by Narimani Rani, the cameraman, and on Manoj Kumar, the filmmaker. And uh, they've used a set of prism filters and mirrors, which came to be then la known later in the industry as the Manoj Kumar filters. The song is visually flamboyant and tonally very tender. Um, look out for those reflections that they create and a sense of visual echoes that they create. Through those, the filmmakers break the boundaries of the film frame, creating these echoes that I mentioned. And these are embedded with memory and nostalgia. They're also embedded with a lot of love and a great feeling of loss. Um, it's a long song that plays out at different points in the film. But I'm going to play up till the first interlude of the main song. It's not a great copy, but the best that I could find on the internet. And um, yeah, let's listen to this. So we get an idea of what they're doing. And it continues in the same vein. Um, like I said, it's a long song. Please watch it on YouTube. And uh, just a little, little later in the film, there's a beautiful play with light the color red, and shifting focus in a rhythmic manner, which is rhythmic and arrhythmic. It's a lesson for everybody, you know, uh, regardless of which discipline of filmmaking you are working in. Uh, uh, Manoj Kumar and Irani together created some of the most flamboyant, celebratory, and memorable song picture picturizations in Hindi film history. Um, and you remember these images, you know, this song is particularly a good example of that. Now, I'm personally very interested in the audacity of filmmakers, you know, who push the limits of cinematography and filmmaking. If Irani and Manoj Kumar have the audacity of the kind that we have seen, there's SNS Shastri from Films Division, who has the audacity of a very different kind. Um, I've always mentioned my great regard for him, for his very complex work that unfortunately gets lost under the generic umbrella of experimental film. And one needs to look at his work with a deeper and nuanced engagement. Shastri was a cinematographer filmmaker with Film Institution, whose best known work lies between 19 and 75. His work was very diverse, and he could move across genre effortlessly from the iconic Talking Heads documentary, I Am 20, which some of you would have seen, to the very tender and very beautiful Amir Khan on the classical singer. But today I'm interested in looking at his overall practice, especially his abstract political films. He gave us a language of political filmmaking which was deeply critical of the state. And it's very significant because this was made from, these were made from within a state organization. Uh, his work is layered with humor, and which is sometimes extremely nasty. He acknowledges being part of the propaganda making machinery of the government and uses archival material from FD as a tool for self criticism. So his work makes a very sophisticated engagement with what came to be known decades later as archival practice and found footage practice. He was doing this in the late 1960s and 70s, and you know, they came into vogue in the moving image art world almost three decades later. So what do you call the act of stealing from your own body of work, repurposing it, giving it newer meanings, and creating visual yet motives that play out in multiple films? And Shastri's films are a great example of that. This is a lecture that go on for days, as some of you would know. But uh, I'll show you what I have here. His filmmaking can range from the very beautiful to the extremely edgy and over the top in different films. And this has a lot to do with his use of a montage, with making meaning out of a mix of archival and new footage, combining completely disparate material. His films made frequent use of fiction cinema references intercut with documentary footage to place themselves within a larger cultural context, as also questioning the entire fiction-nonfiction divide. 
Most film buffs and students will remember the rough date for Satyajit Ray's Aparajito more readily than that of Nehru's death. And you intercut the two and it has a different meaning. His films are as much a study for directors, editors, and sound designers as they are for cinematographers. Um, it's hard to select a representative expert excerpt really from his diverse body of work. So I'm going to show you two sections from his film Flashback, which was made in 1974 uh, to commemorate the Silver Jubilee of Films Division. I'll show you the first clip, which is from the beginning of the film here, and uh, then talk about it. Look at it very, very carefully, what is happening. Remember that this is a Government of India film. And this is a film made on the Silver Jubilee of a state organization. I'll show you the first excerpt and then talk about it. So the film opens with the extreme close-up of a young woman wearing dark glasses, laughing heartily, almost floating down Balisi face in Bombay, as loud and energetic Bhangra music plays on the soundtrack. A cut reveals that she's seated precariously on the spare wheel, the stepney of a Vespa scooter, along with the film's division cameraman, who's seated backwards on the pillion of the speeding vehicle, filming her. She holds on to the cameraman and caresses the camera in an act of risky, erotic, public flirtation. The cameraman holds the camera in one hand and rests his other hand on her exposed thigh. Now, to reach this, read this image literally, the filmmaker seems pretty much in bed with the image of his own creation while publicly speeding down somewhere at great speed. It's a sexualized, glossy, feminine image in love with itself as if in the mirror or in the camera seducing the image maker back. Shastri is on the driver's seat of the speeding vehicle while the cameraman and the image object woman continue their public act of flirtation. You see Shastri later later in the film and we'll see that in the second clip. Um, this scene seems to be a shocking metaphor for the propaganda documentary. It's driven by the filmmaker, SNS Shastri, making glossy, sexed up images of the nation and at the end of that sequence, it cuts to the ethnographic image of impoverished and undernourished tribals, the kind of real documentary, a real subject that documentary films would focus on, which is very different from the kind of image being created by the system as it shows in the first sequence. Now, Shastri was a champion at subverting the state's slogans of nation building propaganda by stressing on individual liberty, desire, and sexuality in his films. The characters in his films refuse to be flattened into this abstract notion of ideal citizens who are produced in the service of the nation. His characters are angry and they express their fr frustration at the failure of the state to deliver its promise. All of this is cleverly inserted into sequences of progress or nation building, all of which Shastri completely believed in, but refused to endorse the state's flattened narrative of progress, which he found himself and his colleagues culpable of making. And um, I am 20 has this key line where one of the interviewees says, uh, uh, it's a film that's made 20 years after independence in 1967, where he travels around the country interviewing people who were born in 1947. So each young person on screen becomes a metaphor for the country that is 20 years old at that point of time. So I'm 20. 
And this very cynical person says, progress. Of course, we have made progress. It's the kind of progress that you show us in your documentary films. But after all, a child grow, even if it has some nourishment. And it's very significant that this is coming in a state film, you know, made by a state filmmaker. Now, his films frequently refer to the act of documentary filmmaking as the construct that it is by placing the camera, its shadow, himself, or other filmmakers in the frame, be they sound recordists, editors, composers, or interviewers. So many of his films therefore become a self-reflexive archive of the people who made these films and with a great sense of idealism. Um, they had a great sense of idealism and because of that, there's also a great sense of disappointment at the failures of the state. Uh, I'm going to show you an edited sequence out of flashback from somewhere more than halfway down and the last sequence again. Um, and uh, uh, you can see that Archival excerpts marking the ends of India in stage documentary are intercut with FD films from the late 1960s, where people are expressing their helplessness and dismay at the state of things. What it leads to is quite shocking, because after that, you know, there's a shot of ritual animal sacrifice, and he splices that with explicit shots of vasectomy surgery, you know, uh, intercut again with a shot of a tree being cut and an animated shot of a large family. He's clearly implying an enforced emasculation and importance of the citizenry, as also the highly controversial family pro planning program of the government. Later in the film, there's a sequence where different voices record, like a voiceover, you know, of an erotic text in different Indian languages. And it seems to be a subverted but valid rendering of the slogan of unity in diversity. The film ends with Sukhdev saying what you'll see him say. So the second sequence from flashback here. History was in the making. No cameras rolled. India independent. A new nation is born. The man has freedom to starve, to go naked. For our people were rejoicing, ready to welcome the long awaited liberty. <laughs> Documentary films had now to play a greater part to make the Indian people country, their problems, their solutions. Realizing the importance of films as a medium of mass communication, the National Government of India established the Films Division in 1948. ये कैसी तपन सभी सोचते हैं धूप से तपित हूं मैं पर नहीं बुझा सकती Mary Piaz. Oh, how I suffer. Ah, that look on Jai. Why, it is not. But there is no water that can quench the thirst of my desire. Kayari ke gutu. Ami taapi to. Ye mawastha ka undi. Ha taap. Sai kyan bhaiya? Pipasa. Kehri yaad na. Moi taapi to. Yaar ke tiriyum. Yaad kaisi lagi hai dil mein. The Indian documentary movement has now grown to adulthood. It's been a long road from the early 40s to the mid 70s in the evolution of the documentary film in India. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> the future of the documentary film. I think it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's rather bright in a way that uh, <laughs> we'll keep on making 
so lots going on over there and uh, one needs to look at every frame one needs to look at every cut and one needs to figure out where those films are from and how they're being juxt juxtaposed in this manner to create meaning um i can't even begin to break it down because you know it would take a lot but the hopeless dismissal of the future of the documentary by a cynical sukhdev in 1974 and this is just before the declaration of the emergency it leads me to nostalgia for the future the film that i co-directed with rohan um incidentally today happens to be the anniversary of the imposition of emergency 45 years ago and um, you have to see shastri's film our indira i'm not showing it um but it's a film where it's supposed to be a geography of indira gandhi on the eve of the emergency uh shastri is too clever he believes in the state but not necessarily the excesses of the state not at all in the excesses of the, of the state at all and uh, he constructs the sequence you know the opening sequence of our indira as a recreation of the opening sequence of leni riefenstahl's triumph of the will where hitler arrives in nuremberg for the famous con conference where um, they decide on the final solution to exterminate the jews and shastri does this by using found material archival material from the fdi archive uh stick it look like indira gandhi is moving across the nation and everybody is following her around pretty much the public follows hitler in nuremberg it's very different but you know if you get the reference it is that and there are hitler references throughout the film and uh, if you get it it's a hitler reference if you don't get it you buy it as propaganda and you can see that the hands were really tied at that point of time um but they leave this record behind they leave this record of their descent behind and uh, it takes a great deal of conviction and skill you know to be able to do it filmically now coming to nostalgia for the future the film that uh, rohan and i made in 2017 it's a film that looked at the idea of indian modernity the making of the citizen and four distinct ideas of the home built for this modern indian citizen over a period of pretty much a century um rohan is an actor i am a cinematographer filmmaker and we have overlapping preoccupations with modernity and citizenship the film was produced as i said with films division and it used a variety of materials archival footage from films division mainstream hindi films from the 1950s sounds and music from public memory our own family photographs as people who grew up with that imagination of the nation the film was shot on digital video in 16 mm in both color and black and white to evoke a sense of history and memory um we didn't shoot on film because it's considered to be superior to video but because the material and texture of that image contains you know a different time register like i mentioned you know the memory of watching films in the past celluloid film immediately has that quality the we decided to shoot like home movies which could possibly have been made by the people who inhabited the spaces we were shooting or as observational footage in the markets holiday footage at public monuments and maybe even unused footage from other people's documentary films so the film keeps shifting these registers throughout between color black and white these various different genres digital and hd video now all of this 16 mm footage that we shot we called it fake found footage it was something that we created but we pretended somebody else had shot it and i'm going to show you the trailer of nostalgia for the future the last shot of it with the titles is made to look like a 16 mm film from the 1970s which nobody has seen and we have possibly discovered so this first and then more about the film
घर ये वो मशीन है जिसमें हम जीते हैं वो लिबास जिसे पहनकर अपने शरीर और अपने परिवार को सुरक्षित रखते हैं यहीं हम अपनी अभिलाषाओं और आकांक्षाओं को भी सहेज कर रखते हैं सपने देखते हैं हम ये उम्मीद करते हैं कि हम अपने ही बनाए सपनों के काबिल दिखेंगे हमारे शरीर अपने घरों को ओढ़ने के लायक होंगे कुछ घर हम खुद बनाते हैं कुछ हमारे लिए बनाए जाते हैं सपने हम खुद सजोते हैं या फिर हमारे लिए सजोए जाते हैं आधुनिकता की कल्पना नागरिकों के एकजुट होकर एक ही समय काल में अपने इतिहास और भूगोल की भिन्नता मिटाकर सांस से सांस मिलाकर काम करने में है विविधता और समानता की धुन की रेखाएं पहचानने में है Now, Nostalgia for the Future is a very dense and quite unprecedented film, um, and it experientially leads you through the ideas of nation building and how they transformed over time. Some of them turned out inadequate, some of them flawed. It's also a film that critiques the documentary establishment's position while looking at the citizen sub subject. The state and the state film take a paternalistic gaze at the individual molding her into an ideal citizen who can be governed but we as independent filmmakers often take a position where this citizen has to be saved from the state and other regions both of these are tenable positions but the gaze is downward in both instances this position makes me uncomfortable when i have to shoot documentaries and uh, yeah i've been in that position frequently I also find it hard to make films about characters I inherently don't like as I'm very uncomfortable with the obvious power of representation that comes with wielding a camera and making a cut and some people will only come across badly in the process that lack of a possibility of nuance looking at or representing someone makes me uncomfortable as I said especially since these are real people um in my films i seem to have developed a relationship with my characters which is about looking at someone and being looked at in return straight at the camera you know it's happened over the years you'll find these sequences in many films where people look directly at the camera and through the camera at the audience it's a look of engagement hopefully and empathy we remain outsiders and we acknowledge that and we remain outsiders representing the lives of others and it is through that look that we attempt to examine our relationship at that point of time with our characters it's a breaking of the fourth wall um, an acknowledgement of the camera and the act of film making as a construct again you see camera shadows on people and scenes where we ourselves appear the closing sequence of nostalgia is one such sequence about looking at the subaltern at the end of a long shooting day 
uh, we were shooting in Gurgaon. We had finished shooting. We were on our way to the airport, and we saw this busty of migrant workers. And while we were filming it, all the workers came and lined themselves up in front of our camera to be photographed. I'm going to show you again something which is the end sequence of nostalgia, a bit of it. We first filmed on video as we were filming, but the light was so beautiful, you know, winter evening light in North India, that uh, something of the documentary pornographer in us wanted to shoot in, shoot it on black and white film as we did. Um, so we'll show that, but you know, many documentary films would end on that note of uh, people looking at the camera in this black and white, wistful kind of manner. Uh, we couldn't do that. And uh, and then talk about it. Have you given the light printer? Yeah, there's no audio on that, so don't worry. I'm also told there might be a bit of a lag in the audio, so unfortunately, I can't do much about it. So we left this as rushes, you know, silent rushes, come back straight from the lab of us looking at them and them looking at us. And what would possibly be the closing shot of somebody's film, but not ours. It's a long uh, closing sequence that goes on. But we found these people, these young men and women, practicing before the festive season, playing the Nashik Dhol, under a flyover just outside our house. And uh, you know, if the subaltern were the people who were left out of the imagination of modernity by the state, here you have people belonging to a similar class who are occupying spaces that are not meant for them. And we found it more appropriate to end on a sequence where people are staking a claim to something that is probably not meant for them. Um, from the golden light of the Gurgaon evening, winter evening, to the black and white, to this extremely grainy, underlit, noisy digital video in Bombay uh, is the end of Nostalgia for the Future. Um, it's a film that changes registers throughout, from the factual to the reflective, from the archival to the fake home movie, from the observational to the abstract, and from fiction to documentary. We steal from all these genres and make them our own. Um, that's roughly as much as what I have. But um, at the end, I'd like to show you this excerpt from my film on art history to let the world in volume one, uh, where Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh talks about his relationship with this practice of referentiality, of borrowing from others' work that exists all around us. So let's watch this, and then we can open up the Q&A.
we always uh, looked at our contemporaries, our peers, and our elders. In a way, it was kind of a, a sense of history you know, that tried to connect, you know, not just see it in isolation, but see in terms of how, what others are doing and what others have done in the past. Then anything that you love very deeply is part of your own, uh, not just consciousness, but part of your being. That your being has, being harbors a space somewhere to allow it to inhabit. So in that sense, you know, the question of ownership, uh, you know, assumes an entirely different meaning. You know? It doesn't mean that it is somebody else's and you are using that. In some way, you also become part of it. That's it. Okay. So um, I'd like to mention uh, that uh, all my films at present are available on my Vimeo channel, which is uh, vimeo.com slash avimuk. A-V-I-M-U-K, for viewing, and I'm going to keep it that way for a while. So uh, you can refer to them whenever you want. Um, thank you very much. I'm done here, and I see that I have only overcarried by eight minutes, which is not too bad. So uh, I can see the questions here, and uh, let me just look at them. OK, so a basic question about um, from Mamun Al Abidin Rehan, that um, they are unable to see uh, this properly due to bad weather. Is it possible to see it later? And uh, yeah, the films will remain online on the Creative Documentary Course Facebook channel and YouTube, and anybody can watch it later. So yeah, um, yeah, lots of compliments and thank yous and thank you back. Um, Tamuchit Bardhan says, lots of questions. Um, if they're there, I'm happy to take them. Um, OK, so yeah, we can wait for some questions. Okay, so there's a question from Rajat Pandey, um, who says, how to get intimate with the character while shooting interviews? Um, Rajat, uh, yeah, that's your question. So there are two kinds of interviews. I mean, one where you have a relationship with the person. Um, and in many of the films that I have made, you know, there's, uh, it's my family or my friends, like, artist uh, Kaushik Mukhopadhyay or um, you know various other people where an intimacy is a given. But when you're shooting with people whom you've just met or um, you are talking about something which is which may be sensitive or private, there are ways to go about this. I mean, one, what is really important for me is to respect the person's state. And, um, a sense of dignity, you know. Um, I'm talking about this approach to the interview. I'm not talking about the investigative, docu investigative documentary or a news documentary, you know, where the relationship and the agenda itself is very different. Um, I'm not talking about documentaries where you're trying to make an expose. But uh, even when you are talking about something that may be private, that may be sensitive, there's probably a way to ask that question, which um, can be conversational, which need not be point blank. Now, again, there's a value to the point blank question, but then your relationship is completely different. And you, since you're talking about how to make your uh, characters relaxed, and I will get into something very practical from shooting where um, don't land up and take over people's houses, don't make a fuss. Uh, we often have a habit of landing up and rearranging people's living rooms. Actually, I have done mine right now, you know. But um, and uh, treat people with respect and uh, 
there's a tone in which uh, you know you talk to people um the question again you know these are interview techniques which again it takes a very very long time and a lot of practice to learn but uh, instead of going point blank to the straight question maybe lead up to it and uh, yeah i'm something like if you want to ask me uh, how i'm feeling right now instead of saying how are you you might say the weather has changed right so i'll automatically give you a more nuanced answer instead of and yeah of course the basic rule not to ask yes no questions but yeah that's getting a little too basic so the basic thing is uh, respect for the characters you know respect for them and uh, their space uh so it starts over there um okay there's a uh, noya kar who says what is auto ethnographic documentary so uh, noya uh, the documentary for a um, long uh, you know a long portion of documentary filmmaking is ethnographic where you are an outsider who's looking at something else and a lot of what you see on television and national geographic you know it's about um, other people it could be a tribe it could be another culture it could be another community and uh, you are clearly somebody from the outside he's look who's looking in and auto ethnographic would be somebody making a film on himself or herself where you are looking at it in the framework of ethnography of sociology um but you're looking at yourself and then the relationship changes you know relationship changes and uh, uh, yeah i mean uh, the filmmaker called ross mckelvey american who's a well known um, example of this who's made a lot of films about himself and his family and that is where he throws in you know a lot of race relationships where uh, he looks at his family and their relationship with their you know domestic hell who are people of color and uh, how it plays out this is something that happens in all our homes and all our families and if we were to make a film about it it would be auto ethnographic so snapshots is an auto ethnographic film but the tone of it is one of intimacy it's not one of distance you know of academic distance so i'll um, go through the questions one more time um i'll take samira's question which is uh, what would you say is the use of irony particularly in political documentary um yes a lot you know um where um, irony is hard to explain really you know um and uh, very often when you're not allowed to say things and you know it, it would be applicable to the state film it would be applicable to any environment of censorship you know where uh, things have to be hinted at and you talk about things through reference um and uh, irony becomes uh, a definite tool you know whether it's coming through people talking about themselves um you put a questions a certain way through voice over you know or you know juxtaposition of their text with image and uh, unfortunately i can't often think of any examples right now but um, yeah maybe i'll get back to this okay kartik has a question um if you inhabit somebody else's work you become part of it as gulam mohammed sheikh says what is the responsibility of one who does this towards the original creator and uh, he says towards ozu now um one is not directly lifting you know if you were to directly lift uh, as an act of plagiarism it's a problem if you're using it as a quotation and you acknowledge it then it's a quotation and that's perfectly valid um but you make it your own and you build on it and you transform it um and it's something that you know we are doing absolutely all the time you know we do it all the time and uh, yeah one has to do it in a responsible manner where uh, i guess i mean that's just basic it 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 comes to questions of basic ethics and human decency where uh, we believe that you have invented the wheel again you know where it has existed all along and you have just 
sat in a new car and you've started driving and you've made it your own. So um, I have, um, wow, a lot of questions all of a sudden. Let me look for something. OK, uh, question by Kumar Nishant. How do you write the script for a documentary? Now, um, that's a very good question. And I have already you know, mentioned how I would expect my characters to write the script for me with help from me. You know? And uh, I mean, if you were to talk about it at a very functional level where you're writing a script for the purpose of fundraising or you know making a pitch or a proposal you do it in a certain way and people have their own formats where uh, you know you write it out for yourself and uh, you know you work out a uh, way the film is going to flow and uh, but you know that talk of inventors that I referred to you know he again in this very macho film school manner says throw the script script away you know and uh, after you've got your funds just throw the script away and do your own thing uh, it's not as easy as that, you know. And when I say you let the characters write your script, uh, let's say, you know, it comes to a film like Snapshots, which is a very specific film. You are uh, talking to your parents. And uh, there's a certain thing that you get out of them. And I was approaching that film in an ethnographic manner for a while because uh, I didn't really know any better. There's another question here from Tamajit Bhattan, and I'll, I'll uh, answer these uh, together. What was the process for making snapshots, and what was the response for your, from your parents? Um, so um, you know, just out of film school, fairly young, uh, documentaries had to be about a certain issue, had to be about a certain you know social subject, and so on. And uh, here were my parents at the end, you know, at the close of pretty much drawing uh, close to retirement and living in different cities at the turn of the century and what would be a more dramatic situation, you know, and you can already start writing voiceovers from so many ethnographic films that you would have seen, you know, about this family, you know, in India, turn of the century, liberalized, uh, globalized India. But it was completely wrong. You know, it was just completely wrong. So the film played out through these moments of intimacy where things got discussed in a quieter tone, you know, um, I kept asking leading questions, and uh, there were different ways in which people responded. My father responded either performatively or extremely earnestly, and it's the earnest bits that uh, have made it to the film. My mother responded performatively and in an extremely camp manner, and that is her performance, you know. So if my father is very earnest, my mother never answers anything straight, and that back and forth performance becomes the language of the film. But um, yeah, so going along, that film had a different traje trajectory. But on the scripting of a documentary, again, it's a much longer discussion, Nishant, you know, which uh, maybe uh, needs more time, which we can look at. How did my parents respond to snapshots? Uh, I still don't think they know how to respond. It's been all these years. It's been 16 years since the film was made. Um, so, yeah, I mean, basic question was, why would anyone want to watch this film? But lots of people have watched the film, you know, all over the world. And, uh, and I guess the point is to take a personal story, to take a one story, to take your story, and then maybe to tell it in a manner that makes it everyone's story, you know, however specific it may be. So um, I don't know how else I can explain that, really. How can you watch my films, Fazia Khan? Like I said, uh, right now they're all available for free viewing on my Vimeo channel, uh, vimeo.com slash A-V-I-M-U-K, Avimuk. There's a question from um, Prakul, who says, um, how do you stop your bias from coming in the way of truth in your documentaries? Again, thank you for that question, Prakul. Um, I make absolutely no attempt to hide my biases because uh, I mean we were told by one of our uh, one of the teachers I respect very well at film school, uh, Professor Kunal, who taught this video, was uh, that 
the act of making a frame is an act of exclusion as much as, as it is an act of inclusion. And uh, there is nothing like objectivity at all. you know. So if you make a frame, it's as much about what you're leaving out of it as it is about what you're including within it. Likewise, with all the content in your films, you know. Um, objectivity, I don't know. I mean, it is your view on a subject. And the truth, anyway, is subjective. I mean, my truth is different from yours, is different from my parents, is different from my friends, is different from my neighbors. So truth is one thing, reality is something else. So this entire dichotomy between truth and reality is where the fun lies and very often where the frustration lies especially in these times, you know, as we are living in right now. So my thing would be that, yeah, my biases are there, but uh, how can I be honest and how can I treat them with dignity is uh, what becomes important for me while making a film. OK, let me look for some more. OK, um, question from Arun Kumar, who says, uh, what do you think about films being a medium of entertainment rather than an art and an artist withering into nothing more than an entertainer? I don't think there's anything wrong with being an entertainer. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess your question is more to do with personal expression versus livelihood. And that's something that uh, remains a lifelong question. So um, yeah, I don't want to give you these uh, you know, uh, spiritual guru kind of answers. But um, like I said, you know, my references are everything from the entertainment film, what is called the entertainment film, um, to, the more, to what would be called the film school film. But again, your idea of entertainment itself might be very different. I mean, what you find entertaining, somebody else might find completely unwatchable. So um, yeah, I mean, art and artist again. You know, it's a it's a it's a minefield. It's really a minefield, and uh, I think it's perfectly fine being an entertainer. Um, yeah. So uh, if art happens along the way, if 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 you want art to happen along the way, and uh, you manage to do it, great. <laughs> okay, a question from Shayan Bhattacharya. Um, even the quality of propaganda films have taken a sharp fall from the birth of the nation to the present day. How do you view... Okay, you, you can read it so you can see what I skipped. But um, how do you view the way propaganda machines can be subverted today in times of fake news and paid media? We cannot, Shayan. We cannot. It's impossible to do that. Um, unless people can do it from within. But then the thing is the volume of uh, propaganda coming at you uh, through structured and unstructured sources is enormous. It's enormous, absolutely enormous. There's huge money behind it. So if films division films were being shoved down your throats before a commercial feature you know, in a cinema hall earlier, uh, there were fewer people watching them. Yeah. They were all watching the same films if they were watching the you know if they if they existed in a particular period of time, like people who grew up watching Doordarshan, they were watching the same things, and that is part of their collective history. But uh, what we're dealing with now is I mean you're dealing with so much fake news. You're really dealing with so much fake news, and when fake news creators say we are going to fight fake news, yeah, I say okay, I'm not getting into these uh, conversations. Um, so uh, I don't think there's an answer. I really don't think there's an answer because uh, across the world they're winning. So, um, yeah, that's unfortunately so. OK, I'll take uh, Ramani's question. Um, thanks, Ramani. So can I say something about working on 
the fiction film Kali Salwar as a cinematographer and my view on fiction films now. Um, Kali Salwar happens to be the only fiction film that I have shot for some reason, you know. And uh, it's very interesting that a lot of people saw it recently because uh, it got available online and because of their fans passing and so on. It was very nice. Again, you know, it was all happening around the same time, whether it was snapshots or my first set of films like Omar Dockey's Kribbles on Akka um, and Kali Salwar. It was all happening around the turn of the century. And there was a lot of energy at, you know, what was happening. It was very nice working with Farida. Um, the fact that, you know, it was shot in this extremely meticulous manner, you know, um, with Farida was really very nice um, with, again, you know, the attention that had gone into scripting, into art direction and uh, uh, the sets that were based on paintings of Bhupin Khakar, the color schemes and Bhupin himself came and painted the set in the studio, the interior. Um, it was a great privilege, plus the kind of locations that we shot at, in, which don't exist anymore in Bombay, which was great work by Surabhi Sharma, you know, who um, was the location person for the film um, was really very special, you know. And uh, what I also like about Kali Salwar is that uh, it has a great deal of humor, you know. It has a great deal of humor, again, ironic humor, which makes it work. Some great performances. So yeah, I mean, I can only gush about it right now. So many years later. Um, okay, I'm not taking budgeting questions right now, so. I can probably do that in person later um, if I know the people. Okay, there's a question from uh, Hardik Mathur. Is uh, gear really important while shooting a film? and to portray the story of an audience to the audience. Um, Hardik, um, it really depends on what kind of film you're making. And uh, yeah, I told Rachet earlier that you should make yourself invisible. But it's possible that you're making a film in a particular manner. Yeah, that question was about putting people at ease. But you could be making a highly stylized film where you know we've shot documentaries on 35 millimeter, on 16 millimeter, on Alexas and all kinds of other cameras. Um, Madhushri Datta, filmmaker whom I worked with quite a lot, um, really believed in pulling out all stops in the production of the film. And she was, uh, again, one person who really um, believed in highlighting the fact that this is completely constructed. So, and if the budget permits, we'll use a crane and there, there's a sequence, you know, there are sequences in her film, Seven Islands in a Metro, shot at night with full lighting, exterior with a crane and a rain machine and, you know, hired actors and extras and so on. Um, yeah, fiction, documentary, non-fiction, a mix of all of those is something that uh, we all work with. So gear, again, depends on what you're shooting and uh, how you're doing it. Uh, John and Jane, this film that I co-shot with K.U. Mohanan for uh, Asha Manuvali, has shot on 35 millimeter, you know. Um, so we do it all the time. It's great fun, and you know, and also it uh, makes you deal with your subject very differently. Um, like Nostalgia for the Future, this 16 millimeter bits were shot with a Bolex camera. And just the way you hold the camera and just the way you look through the camera changes the way you frame. You know, a 5D, you change, you look differently. Another camera, you look very differently. And uh, it changes your filmmaking. And that's where the fun lies. And there, yeah, and there can be times when um, the camera is wrong, you know, the gear is wrong for what you're trying to do. And you have to have the judgment to know that. So, um, okay, so I'll just try and pick the last uh, couple of uh, questions. I'm going up again. OK, I'll take this question by Basav Biradar. Um, I often show the film in my class, snapshots, I guess you're talking about, um, to students. But I think 
I somewhere still doubt the authenticity of the interviews and the constructed narrative. No, 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 you're not talking about snapshots. I've lost something above. Uh, and if you think the interviews and snapshots are not authentic, then I'm in deep trouble. Um, Okay, 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 okay. I got it. Yeah, it's not about snapshots. It's a question um, from Basav, um, which, uh, and he says, I have always wondered how does one read SNS Shastri's films such as We Have Promises to Keep? Um, and there are follow up questions later. I'll try and find them all because we also know the film is state sponsored and it also seems to reveal how normal people seem to like the side effects of the emergency, as you see in the interviews of the film. And I show it in class, and I think somewhere still, some people still doubt the authenticity of the interviews. I think Shastri is very, very smart. And those interviews are meant to look completely fake. Um, they look fake. I mean, don't they? You know, all those people very glibly saying that uh, trains are running on time and there are no queues, you know, that there, there, there are queues everywhere. And it's the best thing that could happen to mankind and so on. Um, the there are two versions of uh, we have promises to keep we have promises to keep is the english version the hindi version is called nayadaur which is a tongue in cheek reference to something you know um and uh, the film is constructed you know the rest of it the non interview bits of the film are constructed uh, like these chase horror c grade bollywood films with these low angle shots of high rise uh, areas in Bombay at one point and this very very loud chase music where they're showing skulls and they're showing smuggling and they're showing uh, all kinds of activity um, as the ills that the emergency is supposed to cure and uh, it's a highly subversive film it's a highly highly nasty film you know made from within the state I think Shasti could only get away with it because he was very very senior within the organization um yeah it's also i guess there's an advantage to falling within that very loose and vague bracket of experimental film where people say okay this is an experimental film so let it be what's the worst that can happen they will not make 100 prints of it they might make 20 prints of it but it's okay the film exists you know for uh, researchers and for crazy people like us who view them 50 years later um it's remarkable you know that film um, so those interviews are extremely fake. I mean, also when you know Shastri's uh, political position, doing his entire body of work, you know, he's somebody who completely believed in the state and what it tried to do and uh, acknowledged its failure and acknowledged that he was a part of that image making machinery, you know. Um, yeah. There was another uh, question around here on uh, Films Division. I'll see if I can uh, find it again. Okay, Nilita Vachani. Hi, Nilita. Who was the head of FD in 1974 who commissioned that extraordinary film by Shastri? Um, I forget the titles, but there was a bunch of people. And, you know, um, all of this started in 1967 after Mrs. Gandhi became prime minister. And uh, they wanted a sense of uh, she was IMB minister first. And we all know that FD had a very bad uh, reputation for being a propagandist, for being one-sided, and worst of all, for being boring, you know, and for being shoved down people's throats uh, in commercial theaters. Now, um, so Mrs. Gandhi brought in Jean Bhavanagri, Jangi Bhavanagri, uh, who was with UNESCO in Paris, and to head FD as creative director. And it was under Bhavanagri that all this experimentation, you know, what came to be called experimental film was encouraged. Um, and this is where people like uh, Shastri, Sukhdev, Pramod Pati, um, Opi Arora, Vijay Chandra, and uh, um, Lok Singh Lalwani, many others, you know, made their best work. And uh, even after Bhavanagri left, Bhavanagri left in three years because that was his tenure, that entire spirit continued for many years, pretty much till the imposition of the emergency. And once the emergency was imposed, then of course things completely changed. So, um, yeah, it was the, the entire Bhavanakri effect that uh, continued. Uh, and it's incredible that, you know, all these films were shown to the public. Um, 
it was unprecedented. You know, one really needs to look at all that work. What really goes unstudied is the work that happened in sound design and experimental music by Pandit Vijay Raghav Rao, you know, which were the first among the first experiments in electronic music in the country. Vijay Raghav Rao also did the music for some of the earliest uh, new wave films, whether it was Bhuvan Shom or uh, many others in that period. Uh, so. Oh dear, I have to take this question uh, from Helzo Singer. Why is the Indian documentary scene hijacked by the radical far left? Why is the nation state your enemy? How do you lead a fulfilling life, fulfilling life with state as the enemy and constantly bickering about so-called, your so-called should be in quotes, oppressors? Um, why does radical pseudo left indoctrination happen at film schools? Case in point, FDI. Um, this is about you, Elsa Singa. It's not about uh, anybody else, really. You know, um, indoctrination doesn't happen, and uh, it's an it, it's it, it's a huge uh, misconception that um, film schools are bastions of the left. You know, um, so again, this is a can of worms and. Uh, I don't want to take trolling, you know, I really don't want to take trolling because there's no end to that, really. The state is not our enemy. We love the state, we believe in the state, we believe in the nation, which is why we find it important to express ourselves when there's a problem, you know. And uh, to be trolled for that, I think, is extremely unfortunate. So, like I said, all those filmmakers, you know, um, found it you know, were disappointed because they were part of that entire image making system. And uh, yes, a lot of the independent documentary filmmaking came from the left. Um, because the left was, you know, the left was among the voices that was raising all these questions at that point of time. Um, the far right emerged much later. And uh, right now, the far right is the establishment. So um, yeah, but uh, I'm not getting into this, honestly. Fantastic. Akanksha Gupta. For a film like Nostalgia for the Future, how did you find your images? Did you find at some point you might run out of new images? Um, that's that's a that's a that's a um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's that's an artistic anxiety that you'll run out of things to say or you'll run, you'll run out of new ways of seeing things or ways of saying things. Hopefully not. Um, how you find your images with a great deal of research as far as you know the archival material is concerned. How you make your images. Um, yeah, I mean, it's something that uh, you respond to the space. You know, you respond to the space, you respond to the architecture. And uh, then you figure out and many of the decisions were made while uh, making the film itself where you're on a particular location and um, you decide, are we shooting this on video? Are we shooting this on film? Are we shooting this on both? Is this color? Is this black and white? And uh, I mean, this is where I guess your entire memory of having seen work and having made work and your instinct become important. Where you say, OK, this is how we are going to do it. And this is possibly a reference, you know, that we're going to use for filming this. So this is a home video. This is somebody else's social documentary. This is somebody's holiday footage and so on. All of these are references, you know, that I'm using while making all that footage. And it's something that we do all the time, you know, where, uh, you know, conversations between um, cinematographer and director or, you know, any other crew members is, okay, we are going to cut this like, or just to throw a, a uh, loose example, this is going to be like Stalker, or this is going to be like Dunita. And you know, in the end, it's going to be like neither. But for that period, you are thinking of that uh, reference, you know. Um, so I think uh, that might be it. There are some other very, very wide questions, which I don't think I can address right now. So um, happy to continue this conversation, maybe offline, um, over email or whatever. 
and uh, so I think I'd like to thank everyone, all of you, um, for joining in once again. And uh, thanks uh, everybody at CDC, SACAC, and Thinking Film. And uh, thank you for the series that you're making with um, you know all the professionals talking about uh, their work. So look forward to more. Thank you.